thank you for joining me. I have a special guest with me. He is a third generation entrepreneur, an acclaimed author and speaker, a philanthropist and global leader with initiatives spanning across Europe, Asia, North Central and South Americas. According to American news and political commentator Van Jones, his remarkable stories, depth of commitment and eloquent communication make him a fantastic resource for everyone who wants a potent dose of grounded inspiration. Uh, please help me welcome CEO and co-founder of the Food Revolution Network, Ocean Robbins. Ocean, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it is my privilege. Thanks for having me, Cornell. You are, uh, as we mentioned in your intro, a third generation entrepreneur. Um, and for those that don't know, your grandfather, Irvine uh, Robbins, founded um, a 31 Flavors, uh, the ice cream parlor, which is uh, globally known as, as Baskin Robbins. Um, tell us about, uh, I guess, give us some insight into Grandpa Irvine. What was he like and what birthed this I idea for an ice cream parlor? Well, my grandpa uh, served in World War II, and when he came back to civilian life, you know, it was the, the, the height of the, the dawn of the baby boom generation, and he got married and settled down and, you know, thought, what am I going to do for a living? And um, he got a job uh, managing a local store, just a little neighborhood store kind of thing, and he noticed that they uh, they sold ice cream, that that was the most popular thing. And he thought, wow, I'd love to go further with this. And he decided to start tinkering. They were just selling ice cream somebody else made, but they started. he started making a little ice cream on the side. And he actually wound up um, getting a deal with a local ice cream factory where they, he could use their equipment in the middle of the night when they were not operating for a really low price. So he was able to just play around, make some flavors and sell them in the store and they sold really well. And uh, so, you know, one thing led to another. He ended up, the guy who was running the store wanted to retire. My grandpa bought the store from him for a really low price, took it over, uh, turned it into an ice cream store because that's what people wanted. And he kept coming up with new flavors and he was working, you know, day and night, making ice cream at night, running the store in the day. And, uh, wound up uh, saying, hey, let's come up with more and more flavors. And then his, his brother-in-law, Bert Baskin, said, hey, why don't we go into business together? And so they started, get, got a few stores going with this. It was called Snowbird. They changed it to, to um, Baskin Robbins. They flipped a coin and my dad's um, uncle, Bert Baskin, won the coin toss. So Baskin went first. And um, you know, uh, my grandpa then came up with this idea, hey, what if we could give more people the chance to be entrepreneurs like I was when I got to run this, this store? It was really fun. Why don't we set them up for success, give them a formula, give them a, give them, give them a whole recipe for success? What kind of neighborhood do you need to be in? How do you position it? How do you design it? Uh, how do you make it look? What are your prices? What are your products? Everything all laid out. And then people can kind of be in business, but not have this sort of fear because most businesses don't make it, right? And so the first 3,000 franchises in the Baskin Robbins chain, because my grandpa kind of invented franchising, they all succeeded. At the time that my grandpa sold the company in, I think it was 1968, um, the, uh, there was not a single store that had, had gone bankrupt. And um, that's, not, that's not the case anymore, but he was very proud of that legacy. So that's my grandpa's story. And then, uh, you know, my own story is a little different. So my dad grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer. He was groomed to join in running the family company. But when he was in his early twenties, he was offered that chance and he said no. And he walked away from a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream to follow his own rocky road. And my dad wound up becoming a best-selling food and health author. The media called him the rebel without a cone. Uh, his books inspired millions of people to look at food as a chance to make a difference in the world. And newsflash, ice cream's not a health food. So, uh, you know, my grandpa wound up reading my dad's books, crediting them with saving his life, changing his diet, giving up ice cream, giving up sugar, <clears throat> cutting way down on animal products, getting way healthier, and um, reversing diabetes and heart disease. Uh, and, you know, being really grateful for my dad's work. So we've really seen in our family that food matters and that when we follow the standard American diet, we get to standard American diseases like my grandpa did. 
His brother-in-law, Bert Baskin, died of heart disease at the age of 54. But we've also seen what can happen when we make a change and how powerful it can be to heal. So that's that's kind of what birthed what I'm doing today, running Food Revolution Network, which I founded with my dad. And today I'm the CEO and our mission is healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. Wow, wow, that's so beautiful. Such a great story. And I'm glad you mentioned that your dad was a pioneer or forerunner for that whole, I mean, your grandfather was a pioneer forerunner for that uh, franchise type business model, because I was gonna ask that. Um, your, your father, John Robbins, was set up for success to run into the business. I'm curious, what was, um, what was grandpa's response when he found out his son did not even want to be a part of this? Oh my goodness, my grandpa was pretty mad. <laughs> you know, I mean, he'd spent his whole life building this business, right? And 99% of the young men in, in the country would have given their right arm for the chance to have that kind of money and that kind of fame and that kind of, you know, business opportunity. And he gets the one kid in the country who says no, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, my dad didn't just say no, he, he ended up moving to a little island off the coast of Canada where he and my mom built a one room log cabin and grew most of their own food and practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day and named their kid Ocean. So it was a very different path. You know, my, my, um, my family would joke that in my dad's childhood, roughing it was when room service was late. Ah. And now my mom and dad were really roughing it, you know, living in the woods. If they didn't, if they didn't grow enough kale, they wouldn't eat any vegetables that winter, you know, like it was like that. And so uh, for me growing up in that context, uh, I experienced uh, that you can eat really well on very little money, which is something I'm really grateful for, you know, because we have this, this myth that healthy food is an elitist luxury and it's not. It's actually a social justice action to invest in food that supports the health and well-being of the community and, and helps to create a world where everyone has enough to eat. And also, quite frankly, it's an act of great integrity to take care of yourself and it's personal responsibility. So you're not dependent on medical systems and insurance costs and government aid to, to be well because you're taking charge of your own health by what you put in your body. So I'm passionate about that. But uh, back to your question, my grandpa was mad. Uh, he and my dad didn't talk for a long time. And uh, eventually, you know, we found that blood is thicker than ice cream. And that, you know, in the long run of things, love has its way with us. And, you know, my grandpa, you know, didn't want to miss out on getting to know his grandson. And so we, we you know, we rekindled a bit. But it was really when my grandpa read my dad's book at his doctor's advice and changed his diet that things really came around. And my dad and I were with him on his deathbed. He was 90 uh, some years back. And you know, he said right then, he said, you know, thank God some of us have lived long enough to learn a few new things. Because mm. when you left Baskin Robbins, he says to my dad, I thought you were crazy. But you know what? Time has proven you were right. And, you know, for following your own star. And so, you know, I'm really grateful and inspired by that. And, you know, I think it takes a lot of courage for a man who's manufactured and sold more ice cream than anyone who's ever lived to rethink his own food choices and to realize that food matters and to be willing to make a change like that. And if, you know, if he can make a change like that, then maybe there's hope for the rest of us too. Absolutely. I want to put a pin there because it's so important to see um, a, a, a man who grew up, had his own way of doing things and now has completely changed his lifestyle. And it's my understanding that your grandfather, you, you said he added like 20 years to his life after developing this new way of eating. Um, talk, to, talk to us about, I guess, what the health challenges your granddad was dealing with and what drastic changes he made to change his life around. Well, he was dealing with uh, serious type 2 diabetes, heart problems, weight issues, high blood pressure. Um, and, uh, you know, his doctors were telling him the way things were headed. He might lose, uh, you know, a limb, uh, have to be amputated because of the diabetes that was progressing. He could have a heart attack at any point. He was told he had to be on, you know, not just blood thinners, but diabetes meds and other medications for the rest of his life. He did not like the side effects of these medications one bit. Um, his health was deteriorating. They said he might only have a year or two to live. And so what he did was, you know, this was around 1989. He ended up, um, you know, 
giving up sugar and most animal products and refined carbs and, and moving towards whole plant foods a lot more, eating lots more fruits and vegetables, starting to eat oatmeal every day for breakfast. I gave up all soft drinks, started drinking grapefruit juice instead, as well as water and tea. And, um, you know, he gave up ice cream, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, he got incredible results. He reversed all of his um, major illnesses. He got off all of the medications he'd been taking. His golf game improved seven strokes. You know, he lost 30 pounds that he badly needed to lose. And he felt, he felt a lot better. You know, he loved his life more. And, you know, he gave up some momentary pleasure with some of the foods he was used to, but he got back a lot more pleasure from being able to take his dog for a two hour walk every morning and, you know, be able to play golf all day and feel good at the end of it. And, you know, just kind of getting his life back. So, you know, uh, he was a happy camper at that point. You know what, I think that's so important to um, highlight because you said grand grandpa died around 90, uh, which was some years ago. And he added about 20 years after the doctor had given him this diagnosis. And I think that's important to highlight because there are so many people who are probably uh, in their late 60s, approaching 70, maybe in their early 70s, who um, succumb to this idea that they are just supposed to have different things because they're just aging. And you told us that your grandfather at probably the age of, we'll say late 60s, early 70s, completely changed his life around. So I, I guess I want to pinpoint that because I just want people to understand that it's never too late. You know what I mean? It's never too late to make the adjustments to change things. Just because you're aging does not mean you have to have these ailments. Let's let's talk about um, let's talk about our food as a nation. You know, because we understand that in America, fast food is the grow, go, growing thing. Uh, you talk about growing up with the farm and having to grow your own food. Um, was it a culture shock when you realized the things that we really happening in America as far as food was concerned? Yeah, it kind of was. I mean, I I um, I started going to school when I was five and being around other kids my own age, and we moved off the little island to a more populated area of Canada. And I was pretty struck by the food culture and how different it was from what I'd grown up in. And even then, I mean, food was a lot more natural in those days, in the late 70s, than it is now. But even then, there was a heck of a lot of flavorings and colorings and preservatives and chemicals in our food system. And um, it, it didn't look like food to me. It looked like uh, what, what Michael Pollan calls food-like products. And, um, you know, I recognize that a lot of this stuff can taste pretty good. You know, that well, the way I look at it, food 1.0 is about survival. If you can get enough calories to fill your belly, that's success. And for a lot of people in the world right now, that's, that's the goal of food, is to survive another day and hopefully to enjoy it a little bit. But food 2.0 is about commerce, the buying and selling of goods. And it's created this epically profitable food industry. But, uh, and it's given the consumer a tremendous amount of power. I mean, consumers have access to, you know, hundreds of different options for sugary breakfast cereals and you know, so many different ways to mix and match chemicals. We have thousands of chemicals in our food supply, most of which have never actually been tested for their impact on human beings. It's, it's brought us 60 pounds of added sugar per year in the American diet, most of which goes you know where on the body, right? And yet, uh, unfortunately, food 2.0 is morally bankrupt because it's completely lacking in care for human health or planetary health, which is why I'm calling for food 3.0, which is governed by health. And, you know, there's plenty of healthy profits in food 3.0. It's just that they come from healthy foods. So I think that's kind of the trajectory that I see us being on. And, you know, I, I, um, I'm hopeful that we can create a world where we have healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for everybody. You know, you shouldn't have to have a particular amount of money in the bank or to have a certain color of skin, or to have a certain geography, or in order to feed your family right, you know, in order to take care of your health. And so our mission in Food Revolution Network is really sharing this knowledge and also changing the food systems for the better. Because, you know, right now, it feels sometimes like it takes your whole paycheck just to eat whole foods. 
you know, uh, organic can cost twice as much. And sometimes the natural option takes so much time and costs so much money. And, you know, if you're working two jobs and you got kids at home, like, how are you supposed to do that? Right. And so our interest is in trying to make healthy food more accessible and more affordable for everybody. So you, it's not like you're being fined for wearing your seatbelt. I mean, if you want to do the right thing for your family and your own health, you should have a society that makes it easier rather than making it harder. And here's the thing right now, there's a few ways that we're making it harder. We subsidize junk food. We have taxpayer money that goes into what's called a farm bill. And that farm bill provides money that uh, in two ways is really destructive to the healthy food movement. Number one, we subsidize, we provide insurance and other subsidies to farmers for what's called commodities crops, which at the end of the day is bringing the down, down the price of high fructose corn syrup, white flour and factory farmed animal products. Twinkies has 14 subsidized ingredients, but broccoli has none. You know, cashews, almonds have none. Uh, legumes have virtually none. So what we're looking at is the money is going to bring down artificially the price of the commodities crops, primarily genetically engineered soy and corn and wheat that are then uh, it brings down the price of those crops and in comparison increases the price to the consumer of the other crops. So that's number one. Number two, we have a SNAP program, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. 50 million Americans depend on this in order to eat. Unfortunately, right now, a lot of the SNAP dollars are being used at convenience stores, 7-Elevens and so forth, which is often all there is available in a lot of so-called food deserts, uh, or sometimes people call it food apartheid. And this is communities where that's all folks have got access to. So a lot of that money winds up going to highly processed, highly packaged junk foods, soft drinks, et cetera. And you know, I'm not interested in you know, being a nanny state, telling people what they can and can't do, but I think we should make it easier to do the right thing by doubling the value of SNAP dollars for fruits and vegetables. Just that one simple action would increase the purchasing power of the communities that are struggling the most. It would increase the demand for fruits and vegetables in low-income communities and help to end food deserts. And studies show that when this is implemented, people buy more fruits and vegetables, they eat more fruits and vegetables, and they're healthier because of it. So uh, we're working with um, an organization called Wholesome Wave to implement this. They've now got this, this, the Double Up Bucks program uh, reaching 500,000 Americans in 20 states. And the pilot results are excellent. We want to see this implemented nationwide with all 50 million SNAP recipients. And so those are just some simple steps we could take. We could change the subsidies. If we're going to subsidize anything, let's subsidize healthy food. And we could change the SNAP program with double up bucks. And in those simple actions, we could make it so much easier for people who are struggling the most right now to feed their families well. Hmm. You mentioned the term organic, and we're seeing so many labels and logos on our foods now. Uh, let's talk about a couple of them non-organic versus organic. Exactly what does that mean? Okay, so um, non-organic is what some people call conventional or regular, because quite frankly, right now, unless something is labeled organic, it probably isn't. So non-organic means that food was grown using synthetic pesticides and artificial or synthetic fertilizers. So, uh, and occasionally it was also, sometimes it was also genetically engineered and it may have been irradiated. So uh, organic means none of that happened. And it also wasn't grown with any toxic sewage sludge. So organic means no synthetic pesticides, no synthetic fertilizers, no irradiation, no sewage sludge and no GMOs, okay? So, and then in the case of animal products, it also means no hormones and um, no artificial hormones or antibiotics were, were detected in the meat. So that's, that's sort of the high level. And why, the, why does that matter? Well, pesticides, there are hundreds of them in the food supply. They've been tested in isolation. And there's usually this thought that we can handle a certain amount of these different pesticides without getting cancer or dying. But the thing is, it's impossible to test them in combination. So when your body is on the receiving end of hundreds of different pesticides, how do we know what they do in interaction together? Um, but we know that a lot of these pesticides are really biocides. They don't just kill pests, they kill life. And 
So when you take them into your body, you're you're kind of um, playing Russian roulette with your health because you don't know what the long-term impact might be. But we know that many of these are endocrine disruptors. We know that some of them are linked to increased risk of cancer in humans and certainly in lab animals. And uh, we know that farm workers who spray these poisons in the field have vastly increased risk of uh, cancer. A life expectancy for farm workers in the state of California, according to one study, is 49 years. Many of them are dying young of cancer. If you've ever heard of the canary in the coal mine, well, you know what? It doesn't take a coal miner to realize that if something's killing farm workers, it's probably not bad, that good for consumers who are eating it, right? So um, pesticides are something I'm concerned about. And uh, Environmental Working Group publishes what they call the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. They look at the most and least pesticide contaminated foods. Every year they issue a new report. The punchline of it is that the least pesticide contaminated tend to have some kind of a shell that you don't eat, like avocados or melons, something that you cut off the outside, mangoes even, papayas even, bananas, oranges, and then the inside is somewhat more protected, right? Um, but uh, some pesticides nevertheless seep through. And so if you go organic, you're avoiding that. You're also avoiding the synthetic fertilizers, which um, NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are the three critical components that are added to soil to make plants grow faster. But there are a lot of other nutrients that organic agriculture brings in through organic fertilizers mm -hmm that are also important to the mineral health and the overall vitality, all the phytonutrients that are in the food you eat. And when you eat commercially grown produce, you risk having depleted soil that's only given those big three and not all the other nutrients that it may need, which could impact the nutrient potency of the food potentially. So, um, you know, those are some concerns. And then obviously hormones uh, in meat have a concern as far as their impact on human health. And there is a link between uh, consumption of hormones through animal products and the um, potential of hormone dependent cancers in the human body. Um, and then we've also got antibiotics in animal products, which are a kind of an, an environmental disaster where we are turning our factory farms into biological weapons factories. They're breeding grounds for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so when you go organic, if you do eat animal products, you're helping to say no to all of that. And uh, lastly, GMOs, um, genetically modified organisms are, are crops that have been engineered to be resistant to glyphosate and other herbicides and to uh, produce the insecticide Bt in every cell of the plant so that they don't need pesticides from the outside because they are living pesticide factories. And so in this case you can't wash the Bt off, it's in every cell of the plant. If a bug takes a bite, its stomach splits open and it dies. We don't think these are harmful to humans, but we don't know for sure. And they maybe have an impact on our gut bacteria. And then glyphosate, which we're now spraying massively on our crops uh, because we've created glyphosate resistant crops. It's an herbicide that kills the weeds, but doesn't kill the plants because they've been engineered to withstand it. Well, glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. It's, a, it's been linked to uh, forms of cancer. It's been considered a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization. State of California requires warning labels on glyphosate saying that, you know, it's known to the state of California to cause cancer. Um, and we're spraying this on our, on our crops in large numbers. So when you go organic, you say no to all of that all at once. It's not a panacea, there's still issues, but it's a whole lot better. It does cost more though. So that's the challenge, right? And so if you go organic, at least with the dirty dozen, that can help. If you're concerned about pesticide contamination and you can't afford organic food, then Try soaking in baking soda solution, like a gallon of water and a to a tablespoon of baking soda. Let it soak for 15 minutes. That gets about 75% of the pesticides out of most foods. Uh, and then you can rinse it after that. So that's, those are some tips. Um, obviously not everyone can do it, but the more we move towards organic, the uh, more sustainable our society will be. It's a way of re restoring farmland, helping to sequester carbon even in some cases, and um, you know, saying no to all those toxins that are associated with industrialized agriculture. Mm -hmm. Wow, so interesting. We're, we obviously have an issue here in America with our food uh, culture. Uh, you're, you've traveled though globally and you've worked and done work in many countries. Who's getting it right as it pertains to food, in your opinion? Who's getting it right? 
Well, the, the, the probably the best places are what's called the blue zones currently. These are the places that National Geographic researcher Dan Buettner studied that uh, have been the places where people traditionally have lived the longest and healthiest lives. And he identified Sardinia in Italy, uh, the um, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, a little area in Orange County, California, um, and uh, you know a few other spots. And what um, you know, what's interesting? Oh, in Okinawa, Japan, I, I should mention that for sure. Uh, what's interesting about the blue zones is that these are places where traditionally people live long, healthy lives, often over a hundred years old, and they're, um, you know, they, they have certain characteristics, characteristics in common in these regions. Uh, people lead a predominantly plant-based, if not exclusively plant-based diet in these regions. They uh, get lots of exercise built into their everyday lives, averaging more than 10,000 steps per day, not because they go out and work out at the gym necessarily, but often because they just have lots of movement built in. They have strong social ties and loving relationships. And in all of these regions, most of the people have a strong sense of spiritual practice or stress reduction or mindfulness or faith that helps give them a sense of purpose that connects to a wider reality in their lives. And so this is uh, fascinating to look at because in fact, these are the same principles that Dr. Dean Ornish identified in his revolutionary lifestyle interventions for heart disease. He was the first researcher to prove that we could not just prevent, but also reverse heart disease with diet and lifestyle more effectively than with modern drugs and surgery. And the Ornish program is now covered by Medicare and the big insurance companies. It's the first lifestyle intervention ever approved for disease reversal in the United States. And the Ornish program has four cornerstones, which are basically the same. It's eat better, stress less, love more and move more. So bottom line is that's the prescription for uh, not just fighting heart disease, but also cancer, type two diabetes, obesity, uh, autoimmune conditions in many cases, and even Alzheimer's. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to live a live, vibrant, live a long, vibrant, healthy life and prevent disease, then that's your key: eat better, stress less, love more, move more. That's what the Blue Zones folks are doing. And that's what the Ornish program advocates and. We have tens of thousands of studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals that make it pretty clear that's what all of us could do better. Hmm. When it comes to disease, you mentioned disease here in America. Out of all the food groups, what, what is the major culprit when it comes to our issues? Uh, I guess you have dairy, you have meat, of course you have the grains, and then we'll throw fast food in there. Which food group would you say is the most prevalent when it comes to diseases in America? Well, uh, gosh, pick your poison, huh? <laughs> I mean, no, I think the, the cornerstones of what I advocate for is four steps. Okay, number one is eat less sugar and processed junk, right? Number two is eat less animal products, especially from factory farms. Number three is eat more whole plant foods. And number four is source consciously, which means go for organic, fair trade, local, natural, uh, you know, options instead of things that come from around the world, things that may have been exploitive in terms of labor practices or treatment of animals. You know, um, all these things matter. At the end of the day, every bite you take is a vote. You're voting for the health you want and you're voting for the world you want. And when you bring your food choices into integrity with your core values, you create the potential uh, for more congruency, more potency, more aliveness, and you get to be a part of the solution on planet Earth. So those are the cornerstones. And, you know, there's been a lot of argument over the years about is fat the problem or is sugar the problem? Well, here's the thing is fat isn't the problem, but bad fats are a serious problem. You know, excess saturated fat, trans fats, definitely a problem. Omega-3 fatty acids, not so much. In fact, they're very good for us for the most part. Um, Omega-6 fatty acids are necessary in moderation, but most of us are getting way, way, way too much. So you know, we need to cut down on the bad fats, eat more of the healthy fats, nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, wonderful, you know, but, um, you know, animal fat, fatty animal products, not so much, you know, um, and then with the sugar and the processed junk, people are like, oh, no, it's the sugar, right? And yeah, sugar's bad, but fruit turns out to be good. So it, it's all about context, you know, added sugars go straight into the bloodstream, can 
cause your body to have to produce a lot of insulin to buffer it so you don't get sick with overly sugared blood. And that can cause problems long term triggering diabetes. So you don't want to eat too much sugar. You don't want to eat the bad kinds of fat. You want to eat healthy sugars like fruit sugar coming from real fruit, not, not fruit juice, but with the whole fruit, with the fiber and everything. And you want to eat healthy fats. Um, and uh, that's, that's the critical thing to remember. Nature is brilliant. And almost all whole foods that come from plants turn out to be really good for our bodies. Um, but when we isolate, when we process, not so much. And uh, you know, animal products in general, in moderation, a certain amount may have some benefit for some people, maybe not, depends on the person and context. But most of us are eating way too much animal products. And as a result, we're deficient in fiber, we're deficient in so many phytonutrients that we need more of. And, um, and we're getting too much saturated fat and uh, even animal protein, which can be very damaging. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier about the soul, soil being depleted, and obviously that affects the, the nutrients in the food we're eating. Um, let's talk supplementation briefly. What supplements do you recommend and why? Okay, so the big three are going to be EPA and DHA, so that, uh, which I count as one thing, omega-3 fatty acids, essentially. Um, so there's, there's three omega-3 fatty acids, ALA, EPA, and DHA, and ALA is more prevalent. Most of us aren't so deficient in it. You can get it abundantly from flax and chia seeds. Uh, EPA and DHA are only found in algae and certain forms of fish. And uh, your body can convert ALA to EPA and DHA, but not everyone does so efficiently. So that's, that's number one. Number two is gonna be B12. The average, um, about 20% about of Americans are deficient in B12. Uh, it's particularly problematic for vegans because B12 is only found uh, pretty much in animal products, um, but even omnivores are often deficient in it. So taking a supplemental source of B12 is smart. It's cheap, doesn't taste bad. So it's just a good idea. Um, and then the other big three is gonna be uh, vitamin D. Most of us in the modern world don't get a lot of uh, sunshine. We need probably about a half hour a day over, over half our body in order to make our own D3 in optimal quantities. Actually more for people who have more melanin in their bodies and in their skin. And uh, so most people are deficient, bottom line. You wanna have you know, a score of at least 40 in your bloodstream, ideally over 50. And a lot of people are in the 20s or 30s and that it has an impact on your immune health and your likelihood of a whole bunch of different diseases. So getting enough D3 is critical and it's super easy to just take a little supplement. So those are the big three that most people should be taking every day, in my opinion. Uh, with the omega-3s, you may not need it if you eat wild fish, but that comes with mercury and heavy metals and ethical consideration. So some people don't wanna do that. Um, and then somewhat less problematic, but still an issue for, for some people, there's, there's gonna be zinc, selenium, magnesium, iodine. Uh, a lot of people get enough of those, but it doesn't hurt to consider supplementing with those if, um, you know, and you can also get a blood test and, and find out whether there's any concerns there. Um, with selenium, just one Brazil nut a day will meet your needs. So that's another way to handle that one. Um, and, uh, you know, iodine is usually handled just if you eat sea salt that has iodine added to it but some people don't eat much sodium or are choosing to eat some of these fancier Himalayan salts and whatnot that haven't been iodized. And if that's the case, you could be in danger of deficiency because it's only found in certain seaweeds, a little bit in certain fish, but a lot of people aren't getting much iodine. And, and iodine is important for, important for thyroid function. It's the number one nutrient most linked to healthy thyroid. So you hear about all the hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism and you know Hashimoto's and so forth going around. And a huge percentage of that is linked to iodine deficiency. Wow, wow. You're the CEO and co-founder of Food Revolution Network. Um, tell us about this network and who it's for. Food Revolution Network is on a mission. We want healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all. We offer online courses and website articles, thousands of articles on our website, recipes, summits, um, and other resources to help provide knowledge and resources and empowerment to help everybody eat awesome, fabulous, healthy food and be a part of the solution on planet Earth. 
So um, you can find out more at foodrevolution.org. You can get my book, 31 Day Food Revolution, which walks you through the simple steps you can take to apply all that we've been talking about today in your life. Uh, 31 Steps to Health can bring you more pleasure and more joy than 31 flavors of ice cream. That's the thesis of the book. And uh, so, yeah, you can join us as an organization, but you can also join us in your heart every time you choose real food over processed junk, every time you decide to vote with your dollars for the health and the world you want, you're part of the food revolution and I thank you for it. Yes, yes. Before we wrap, I gotta get you to play this quick fun game with me. It's called My Five Favorites. I'll give you two options and you share with me which is your favorite of the two. Ready? Yes. First, kale or spinach? Kale. <laughs> Asian inspired or Southwest West Mex? Asian inspired. Okay. Soup or porridge? Soup. <laughs> Curry or cayenne? Curry. Ah, me too, me too. Last, <laughs> last one. Now, you may have to go back a little ways for this one, but vanilla or Rocky Road? <laughs> Rocky Road. <laughs> <laughs> Your taste buds still remember, huh? <laughs> they do. So good, so good. Ocean, I appreciate you joining me as we prepare to wrap. Give us some last closing thoughts and uh, uh, a potent uh, dose of inspiration, if you will. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you for being here and listening and learning. You know, I think the most powerful force in the world uh, may be human curiosity. I mean, when, when we're learning and growing, we become capable of so much because evolution is moving through us. You know, we aren't just a product of what we've been through or what we've learned in the past. We're a product of what we discover in real time in interaction with the world as it is. And the truth is that the operating systems that got us to this point have served us, but they will not enable us to make it where we need to go. Humanity is on a collision course with systemic environmental collapse. We have epidemic rates of disease. We have more people sick and fat than any population in the history of the world, but we can turn that around. When we learn how powerful food is, we can apply what we're learning and get tremendous results. You can slash your risk of most of the major chronic illnesses of our times. You can contribute to a world with topsoil, with water, with a stable climate, and with plenty of food for future generations. And you can do so deliciously when you choose to apply the food revolution in your life. So thanks for being here. Thanks for learning. And thanks for being a part of the solution on this planet every time you are. Well said, Ocean. I appreciate you joining me. And thank you for the work you're doing. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on, Cornell. Thank you for yours. All righty. Take care. You too.